Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's Germination Retail Roundtable webinar. My name is Mark Zinkowitz, and I serve as editor for Germination, and I'm happy to be your host. Today's theme is how the clean fuel regulations could fuel innovation in oil seeds, specifically canola and camelina. We'll hear from three experts on this topic who will explain the regulations and what they might mean for oil seeds development in Canada. Now, before we begin, I'd like to thank our two retail, retail round table sponsors, excuse me, for their support, 2020 Seed Labs and Secan. Now, if you have a question for any of our speakers during today's webinar, please type it into the chat box at any time. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website, germination.ca, within 48 hours. And again, if you have a question for our speakers, please type it into the chat box at any time. You don't have to wait until the end of the webinar. You're free to, uh, to type that in whenever you'd like. Now, today we'll hear from three speakers who are going to talk a little bit about this topic of, of the clean fuel regulations and how it could impact the realm of, of oil seeds and, and biofuels. Now, earlier this year, the United States Environmental Protection Agency approved canola as a feedstock for renewable diesel, jet fuel, and other fuels under the U.S. Renewable Fuel Standard. The Canola Council of Canada has hailed canola as Canada's ideal resource for clean, renewable fuels. Canada has implemented its own clean fuel regulations, which in a nutshell will ensure the gasoline and diesel that Canadians use every day will become progressively cleaner over time and affordable alternatives will be increasingly available to consumers. Now, as I said, today's webinar is designed to enlighten all of us about Canada's clean fuel regulations, what they are and what they could mean for Canada's canola and oil seed sector and specifically the seed industry as well. Now, today's speakers are Steve Pratt, Senior Manager, Transportation and Biofuel Policy for the Canadian Canola Growers Association. Welcome, Steve. We also have Chris Verve, Executive Director of the Canadian Oilseed Processors Association. Chris and Steve, welcome. How are you today? Thanks, Mark. Doing well. Pleasure to be here. Yep, thanks. Excellent. And we'll also talk with Jack Grushko. He is CEO of Smart Earth Camelina Corporation based in Saskatchewan. Jack could not join us live today, but I did pre-record a short interview with him that I will play at the end of the webinar. Now I'm going to turn the floor over to Steve, who's going to talk about the clean fuel regulations in regards to biofuels. Thank you so much for your time today, Steve. It's great to see you. And I will turn the floor over to you so you can explain this whole clean fuel regulation business, exactly what it is and, and what it means in regards to, to biofuels and, and canola. Take it away, sir. Well, thank you, Mark. I um, do appreciate the opportunity to um, speak to uh, those on the webinar today. And indeed, it's, it's going to be a bit of a challenge here. I'm going to take six years of regulatory development. I'm going to take a actual regulation that's 229 pages of regulatory text plus umpteen hundred other pages of interpretive guidance. I'm going to condense it for the viewers in 10 minutes. And, and hopefully my goal is to leave people with an appreciation of what the clean fuel regulation or what, what we call the CFR, what it is what it tries to do and what it isn't, and then how, again, we can kind of see canola, oil seeds, other um, agricultural crops grown in Canada, um, ideally um, you know, create the, the most value and capture opportunity from within this uh, new regulation that we have here in Canada. So with that, I just wanted to set the stage around canola biofuels specifically. And when I refer to biofuels in the context of canola, I'm referring to biofuels in the diesel space. And we really think, and you see that sub, sub um, headline, growing low carbon solutions. That's the way we look at um, the role canola can play in the biofuel space. And, and really we've been working at this as an industry from the growers to the processors under the umbrella of the Canola Council of Canada. We've been working on this for, I have 25 years here of proactivity in this space, um, but certainly it's, it's more like three decades. Um, 
looking to help governments when they are moving towards implementing um, regulations around fuel and biofuels um, with guidance on um, you know, practical policy solutions um, and our perspective on regulations while they're in development. And really why biofuels, it's really fourfold. Again, there's a sustainable domestic demand from the farmer's perspective. Um, certainly as canola, um, we have a very uh, trade um, uh, trade exposure globally, uh, globally traded uh, commodity over 50 given countries in, in, in a year. Um, and here is an opportunity for domestic demand and capturing uh, all those things that come out of um, increased processing and use in country or continentally. And certainly there's that market diversification aspect um, for the processed product that um, Chris and the, the members that he represents on the, on the processing, oil seed processing side, um, capturing that highest and best use uh, domestically, um, as opposed um, to necessarily the uh, exportation of, of raw seed. And, and thirdly, in the, in the policy um, and regulatory realm, I mean, we've got governments, be them national, um, be them subnational at the provincial or state levels, um, um, south of the 49th, they have policy goals now going on um, over a decade and, and some, some newer, but with a focus on decarbonization of, of fuels and transportation fuels. And here is a way through the use of biofuels and supporting good prudent biofuel policy is a way that um, the canola sector and canola farmers can directly contribute to the environmental goals and aspirations of governments um, on their pathways and, and to decarbonization. And really the kind of the other side of this, which is um, kind of related to all three, uh, is the investment in rural communities um, and with the expansion of value-added activities. And I know that Chris, in his presentation and remarks, will dive into that a little deeper. So really, I guess the takeaway for the viewers and those listening to this is that we see canola-based biofuels as a benefit to the total Canadian economy and the whole value chain from the seed developer um, to the exporters of a product and then the, the end users. So. That's the kind of overarching um, impetus as to why um, we are working in the biofuel space as an industry and, and why farmers and the industry are um, interested in these type of policies. So really the overarching opportunity here of the clean fuel regulation is that, um, or and in just biofuels in general, is that um, transportation as a emissions profile of our country and other countries is fairly significant and can be easily pointed to as an area where um, you know the fuels need to um, lessen their carbon intensity. So I, I noted here in Canada, um, transportation sector accounts for approximately a quarter of the total emissions of our country. And um, by a number of different measures and systems, um, you know, Canola-based biofuels, and again, we're talking about diesel, um, they have proven and quantifiable um, means to lower the carbon intensity, and which is you know, valid through a variety of different, or validated um, through a variety of different um, you know, peer-reviewed and uh, scientific um, um, kind of carbon intensity calculators that are used by the various jurisdictions as they um, account for the, um, less, less, you know, the lowering of carbon in fuels. And I guess really, one thing to keep in mind when there's all sorts of policy talk around decarbonization of fuels and clean fuel regulations is that there's lots of aspirational things that are talked about and pointed to, but in the here and now with biofuels and canola based biofuels in the diesel pool, we have existing proven technology that exists at scale that is operational now, which we can incrementally expand moving forward to some point in the future where maybe everything is all, all green and, and, and carbon neutral at some point down the road, but that's certainly not in the foreseeable future. And here's one way that Canadian agriculture, the canola industry can um, help move jurisdictions and the obligated parties of the various regulations to meet their um, requirements under the various um, regulatory schemes that wherever they might be domiciled and working as a company. So. And obviously diesel fuel used in, in heavy transport in the resource sector and obviously in farm operations. So let's get down to it here. The clean fuel regulation, it's Canada's new uh, regulatory framework. Um, the current government um, started on the path towards this development of this new regulation in 2016. It is supplanting and replacing our Canadian renewable fuel standard, which sets a um, 2% volumetric mandate for diesel fuel. Um, so 2% has to be of a bio blend. And that's been in operation since 2010. 
And now, as of next uh, year, next next summer, um, we have the clean fuel regulation comes into uh, into effect, and the obligated parties um, need to satisfy this regulation. And I want to um, underscore and highlight for the viewers that this is a complicated and a wide-ranging policy approach. This is very different from what we think of as traditional renewable fuel standards that set a percentage that must be used um, in, in a fuel pool, be it ethanol or um, in, in the petroleum side and, and diesel, um, you know, with, with biodiesel bio or renewable diesel. Um, this is maximum flexibility for the obligated parties. And under the CFR, the obligated parties in the regulation are those who produce and import fuels into Canada. And they, um, there's, there's a numerous ways that they can satisfy their obligations, which we'll talk to in the next slide. But here, the overarching goal is this traje lowering trajectory of the carbon intensity of fuels um, moving forward and according to a schedule. And what's different about this policy in Canada, it is housed um, regulatorily and administratively within Environment and Climate Change Canada. So it's not uh, Natural Resources Canada, it's not Ag Canada, it's um, ECCC is the, um, the body which houses it uh, re regulatorily. And the, this is an important piece. There's going to be a gatekeeper to this regulation, and it's this new fuel low carbon um, Low, low, car, low carbon um, uh, life cycle mo uh, model, which ECCC has developed, which has been, um, it was released in parallel to the regulation. And that is going to be the quantifier of the emissions reductions that are used by the obligated parties to satisfy um, their regulatory requirements under this. So you've got the regulatory text, which sets the kind of rules of the game and the actual gatekeeper of the regulation and the adjudicator is this new fuel LCA model. And again, the big takeaway here is that the, ma the, the, the whole five or six years of regulatory development, the key mantra or watchword in the development of this was flexibility. So there's numerous ways that the obligated parties can satisfy their obligations under this. Um, and we'll get to that um, here shortly. So basically, um, the regulation was published the final gazetting, the Canada Gazette 2 um, in our system, uh, was uh, done earlier in July. The regulation comes into effect July 1, 2023, and the obligated parties will need to start um, demonstrating and proving that they're putting lower carbon intensity fuels into the market from that time forward. And there is a schedule in the regulation that shows the decreasing, you know, um, the decreasing amount of carbon intensity on a curve um, out to 2030 currently. I just alluded to it a moment ago, but there's three major kind of compliance pathways, or we call them buckets, that the obligated parties and those in this space can generate credits. And biofuels is one of them. One of them is uh, they can do things within their own, um, their own um, at a refinery, you can make upgrades, improvements. There's some, some trading um, options and whatnot. And then there's some things around um, electric vehicles and, and, and fuel switching. But then biofuels is this second, um, in the regulation, it's a second compliance category. So I just wanted to, again, leave you with the idea that the obligated parties under this regulation have various ways they can comply, and biofuels is but one. And from a farmer's perspective, and this is where we've been um, intently um, working, is around this land use and biodiversity criteria for canola and other um, ag products and forestry products that will maybe use as biofuel feedstock. Um, those regulations, that, that, that element of the regulation comes into effect Jan 1, 2024. And there's been much interaction with ECCC in the policy development around this aspect, because this is the part that actually touches the farm gate and, and farmers as far as um, and in the canola system as a bulk system, you don't necessarily know if your actual canola seed that you're delivering to the crush plant will be used in biofuel production or, or um, human consumption or where it might end up in a, as a home market. But um, this love criteria was one thing that we've worked um, very diligently on. And, and you'll see that on that fourth bullet where the love criteria and the fuel LCA model. The fuel LCA model, again, was being uh, produced up from scratch. And um, canola industry has been, as I mentioned at the outset, involved in biofuels for many years and has exposure and has worked with um, companies and, and other organizations that are using fuel models in other jurisdictions. And, you know, with this, um, the bringing on of this new, this new LCA model, we wanted to ensure that we had from the get go and the start of this regulation that it had the most precise and best um, data driven solutions in there for what we perceive to be our, or what we'll argue is our advantage um, 
as, as a canola, as a, as a low carbon feedstock. And so I guess I'll just leave you with the, um, the thought that this clean fuel regulation federally is going to sit on top of the existing biofuel regulations in the various provinces. And I do know that Chris has a slide to quickly speak to that in a moment. But the CFR is going to sit on top of the um, other existing provincial regulations. So the final thoughts on this, as far as the CFR goes, is, hey, the regulation has been finalized. We still do have several interpretive and administrative issues that are going to be worked on with the um, department, and that has started in earnest now in August and moving through the fall. So um, we are, are going to see some interpretive um, guidance coming out and um, uh, some of the operational issues. So I would just leave you with that. Due to the regulatory the flexibility that's inherent in this, um, it is difficult to confidently project the, you know, the biofuel uptake and, and the use of canola in a dynamic marketplace as a feedstock. But we have put our heads together um, around some of those um, scenarios. And really, the field has been set now. There's a lot of five and six years of the development. And um, you know, now farmers, um, in individual companies uh, in the processing space, um, those um, who are actually producing biofuels. Um, now that the rules of the game have been set, um, they can kind of line up and start to pencil out how they might be able to interact and, and, and create value in this value chain. And I guess my last point, Mark, will be that um, this is not a done deal. Um, although the regulation is there and will take, you know, changes to it might be down the road. Um, because of the dynamic nature of the fuel LCA model and a bunch of other um, aspects, it's going to require vigilance and active intervention moving forward, be it on the um, LCA model or other aspects to ensure um, that canola or Canadian ag um, products and, and the, the, the way feedstocks are treated within this regulation um, have the optimal outcome. Thank you so much, Steve. That was terrific. And, and in, in regards to canola growers being with the Canola Growers Association, what sort of uh, benefits do you see for canola growers in the future? I mean, these sorts of uh, biofuels, I mean, can they be used like in farm equipment, tractors? I mean, what sort of like tangible, immediate benefits do you see these sorts of fuels maybe having in the future? Sure. So um, I guess, you know, as to your question about um, equipment and whatnot, I mean, we've got kind of, um, we think of biodiesel, where you actually took the vegetable oil and you mixed it with the diesel, and um, that's been around for, for years. Um, it has, it does have some uh, parameters and some kind of um, yeah, utilization factors that have to be kept in mind. Um, but where we're at now as a kind of global fuel industry and North American fuel industry is this move towards a renewable diesel, or sometimes referred to as HDRD, where it's chemically indistinguishable from petroleum diesel. So zero operational considerations, zero compatibility issues. And the third thing that's being looked at very closely and even in the trial phase is uh, what we call co-processing, where at the actual refinery, biofuel feedstock is be, or low carbon feedstock is being fed into the actual um, uh, processing of the full slate of materials. So the biodiesel and some of the issues and impressions of it from 25 years ago, um, you know, all this, any fuel sold in Canada has to be at spec if it's coming from a, a you know, a, a mainline retailer. Um, there are considerations with the biodiesel, but the, the, the HDRD or the renewable diesel and then the co-process mater co material um, not an issue. And you do look at, you know, the, the, the various big manufacturers and they, um, they do have um, guidance on the websites around the use of biodiesel in their machinery. Um, but, you know, problems that might have ar arisen 30 years ago, um, you know, there's still considerations on the biodiesel side, but biodiesel, you can almost think of that as the first generation. And now we're moving forward with other technologies where all those kind of legacy issues are no longer um, on the table. I'm hmm. looking forward to seeing what happens. Thank you so much for educating us on this topic, Steve. If you have a question for Steve, please type into the chat box at any time. I'm going to turn the floor over to Chris next. So hang on the line, Steve, and we'll chat with you again shortly. Our next speaker, as I said, is Chris Verve. He's Executive Director of the Canadian Oilseed Processors Association. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Thanks, Mark. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, and pleasure to have you. You're going to talk a little bit about what all these clean fuel regulations, what this whole thing means for oilseed, for the oilseed sector, oilseed processing. I asked you to be on the webinar today because I actually saw you speak on this topic back in July at the Seeds Canada meeting in Winnipeg. 
you gave a talk on this exact subject. So this is something that could have potentially big implications and opportunities for the seed industry. So I'll turn the floor over to you now, sir. Please enlighten us. Thanks, Mark, and appreciate the kind introduction. Um, so my presentation is going to focus a little bit more broadly on what is driving the biofuel production in North America and what that means as it relates to crush expansion as well. So before we get started, and my colleague Steve already covered some of this ground, but it's worth just having a quick biofuels overview or 101, if you will. Um, so again, as Steve indicated in his presentation, biofuels are a proven and viable solution to decarbonize transportation fuels in the here and now. And when we talk about biofuels derived from crops like canola, um, they have a lower carbon footprint than conventional diesel fuel. This is why they're so attractive and this is why uh, we're seeing such interest in biofuels uh, now and in the coming years. When you talk about canola specifically, it has a lower carbon footprint of up to 90% uh, lower uh, compared to conventional diesel fuel. So those are tangible emission reductions that can come from using more canola-based biofuels. In the marketplace today, uh, some of the biofuels that folks are probably familiar with include ethanol and biodiesel. Uh, biodiesel, of course, can be made from uh, canola. Uh, Steve touched upon, you know, the advent of renewable diesel and how that is growing in a big, big way. And my presentation will cover that in some additional detail in terms of what we see happening in the renewable diesel space. And sustainable aviation fuel, uh, relatively new in terms of its production in North America and globally. My presentation won't really talk a lot about sustainable aviation fuel, only to say that it's available in the marketplace today and we expect that to grow by leaps and bounds as well over the next 5, 10, even 20 years. But in order to get biofuels um, uptake and to have a market for biofuels, it's all about policy and regulations. And I think Steve did a nice job covering off one of the major biofuel policies here in Canada, which is the clean fuel regulation. And what I'm going to do is just provide a little bit more of a snapshot of the different biofuel policies that we see in Canada. Uh, in addition to the clean fuel regulation that Steve covered in his presentation. So again, across this province, we have different uh, regulations, primarily regulations uh, that mandate certain blending rates uh, for different biofuels. So just by way of example, um, in Manitoba, we have a 5% blending mandate for renewable and biodiesel. In British Columbia, we have a mandate of 4%, but we also have um, a low carbon fuel standard, very similar to the clean fuel regulation that was recently uh, published in Canada across this country, a federal clean fuel regulation or clean fuel standard. BC has had one in place for the last 10, 12 years now, and it currently mandates that the carbon intensity of fossil fuels need to be reduced by 20% by 2030. If you look closely at BC, you'll see a plus sign next to the 20%. Uh, that means that BC is upping the ante. Uh, that means they are looking to make changes to their existing regulation. Uh, so they're actually considering perhaps moving to a 30% target. Uh, that's something that's under development. And, and really what I want to take away from this slide to be is that we've got many different policies across this country that are driving more biofuel demand and there's increasing changes and stringencies happening as well as per what we see unfolding in BC. So when we talk about biofuel policies and opportunities for canola, uh, for example, we really need to be looking a little bit more broadly, as I said at the outset of my presentation. So we take um, a Canada, US or North American view as it relates to the different opportunities that biofuels might bring for the canola industry. So the previous slide talked about Canada, and I'm going to attempt to give a quick snapshot of the U.S. biofuel policies, and there's many, so I don't have all the time today to cover off all the different incentives and policies that exist in the United States, uh, but they have something called the Renewable Fuel Standard, which mandates uh, volume blending in that country uh, for both ethanol and for advanced biofuels like renewable diesel and biodiesel. And on the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see just over the last decade or more, 
the incremental increase in those volume mandates that have occurred. So it's just been steady growth as it relates to the amount of biofuels that need to be blended in the United States through their renewable fuel standard. Augmenting the renewable fuel standard in the United States, which is federal in nature, are state low carbon fuel standards. And this has really set off a lot of interest in biofuels in particular. When we look at the Western states, California really being the leader, they've had low carbon fuel standards in place for the last decade, similar to British Columbia. And that's really what's been driving a lot of the increased interest and demand for biofuels in the United States. And I'd say also in Canada. And we also see a lot of other states kicking around the idea of implementing low carbon fuel standards. So we have the federal standard and then we have the state policies and regulations, the low carbon fuel standards that are really starting to drive demand for biofuels in the United States as well. So as it relates to demand and production of biofuels in North America, and again, when I talk about biofuels, it's going to be about renewable diesel and biodiesel. These are the core products that really drive demand for canola. Um, we have seen really steady growth in both renewable diesel and biodiesel demand and production. And I say largely because of the slide that I put up uh, previously that really demonstrated the growth in the renewable volume mandates in the United States, augmented, of course, by the low carbon fuel standard. That's not to say that Canada doesn't have a role. We're just a smaller market. Um, those provincial policies and regulations are clearly demand drivers, and we certainly believe that the clean fuel, the clean fuel regulation will also uh, be able to drive future demand for uh, biofuels in North America. And we've taken a crack at trying to guesstimate what those, what that demand might look like from ever changing and, and, and more stringent biofuel policies, both in US and in Canada. I think Steve said it quite rightly, it's really difficult to guess what it might mean. There's different folks out there who have done analysis in this space and we're drawing on some of that analysis to come up with our own predictions. And again, I really wanna underscore, this is a scenario, uh, this is, perhaps one possible way that things could play out on the demand side for renewable diesel and biodiesel. So basically what we think could happen is we see demand of biodiesel and renewable diesel between Canada and the US at roughly 11 billion liters today. Uh, fast forward to 2030, we see the potential for that to grow to just over 17 billion liters. And I think what gives us some level of confidence that this demand scenario could play out is the actual commercial reaction, uh, the supply response to some of these demand signals that are starting to come out through the regulations in Canada and the US. So I'll start with the United States. Again, this is the big market. I'd say that they were probably first out of the gate as it relates to the build out of additional biofuel capacity. So what the map on the left hand side shows is the build out of renewable diesel capacity in the United States. Uh, through different announcements and different projects that have been under construction now for the last uh, couple of years. So this is all happening extremely quickly. So when you look at the right hand side and that bar chart, um, we see existing renewable diesel capacity in 2020 at let's say about 2 billion liters. In just two years time, we've seen that capacity explode to almost 8 billion liters. And it's not done there. When you look at that, again, that map on the left-hand side, there are a lot more companies that are either announced capacity for renewable diesel production or already under construction. If it all comes to fruition by 2025, we could see renewable diesel production capacity be close to 18 billion liters. Uh, so really an amazing supply response happening in the United States at the moment. Not to be outdone, um, Canada has started to see the opportunities or the companies and different players in Canada have started to see the opportunities in renewable diesel production. And um, we see production perhaps growing very rapidly as well in this country. So when we look at 2022, essentially we have close to zero production capacity for renewable diesel in Canada. But again, fast forward a few years, five years from now, 
um, that capacity could explode to about 4 billion liters in this country. And it's being led by, you know, some of the big energy players in this country. So when we talk about Federated Co-op in Regina, we talk about Imperial's announced facility for renewable diesel just outside of Edmonton. We have Parkland and Tidewater in British Columbia. These are companies that, you know, traditionally are in the fossil fuel sector, but they are starting to make big announcements, big investments in renewable diesel because there's an obligation there for them, but they also see it's one of the best ways to decarbonize fossil fuels is to incorporate renewable diesel into traditional fuels. So what does that mean for crush expansion? We've seen the announcements being made. We've seen the construction start to take place as it relates to renewable diesel production capacity in Canada and the US. Um, and now we're starting to see that trickle down to crush expansion. And I know that we're here to talk a little bit more about canola, but it's really, again, a North American view that we need to take as it relates to crush expansion as well. Um, there's been the announcements made in Canada by Richardson, Viterra, Cargill, and Federated Co-op slash AGT. Uh, impressive announcements, all in uh, Saskatchewan with regards to canola processing. If all of those plants come to fruition as announced, that could grow crush capacity by, let's say, close to 6 million metric tons by around 2026, 2027. And that would make the entire industry's crush capacity grow by about 50%. So reaching close to about 17 million metric tons by that 2025, 2026 timeframe. So amazing, never seen before type of expansion taking place here in Canada. The exact same dynamic is starting to unfold in the United States on the soy crush side of the equation. So just peppered throughout the Midwest, you'll see lots of different announcements being made under construction plants um, that are there to crush soybeans for the purpose of feeding into the growing uh, renewable diesel market. Um, some estimates based on public announcements and different analysis uh, suggest that we could see soy crush grow by 15 plus million metric tons by 25, 26, which represents about a 25% increase from the, uh, the crush capacity today. So again, I'll just underscore in this slide, unprecedented growth in crush uh, in North America, something that most folks have never seen before in their time working in this uh, business. So backing it up a step further, what could this mean in terms of use of canola in biofuels? Again, I want people to uh, recognize this is a projection. It's a utilization scenario, if you will. But again, based on the different analysis that uh, we've undertaken, that others have undertaken, and some of the comments I made about what's actually happening in the commercial space for renewable diesel production and the crush expansion that's already underway, uh, we see the potential for uh, canola use in biofuels to grow from about 2 million metric tons, seed equivalent in 2020, to about 6.5 million metric tons by 2030. Uh, so Again, this is just one possible scenario, but we think that is certainly achievable based on some of the dynamics we see unfolding over the last number of years and what we likely will see continue to unfold in the decades to come. Um, so what does that mean in terms of um, the percent of biofuels used in canola uh, as it relates to canola production? So roughly, you know, between Canada and US, there's about 20 million metric tons of canola produced, maybe a little bit more, uh, about 21, 22, let's say. Um, by 2030, we see production continuing to increase. Uh, farmers continue to be able to get better yields on their, um, on their land. Uh, th there's better practices being adopted by farmers. All that to say, we have a high level of optimism that we'll continue to see productivity grain, gains for canola, uh, reaching production volumes of about 29 million metric tons, perhaps by 2030. So when you take six and a half million tons used for biofuels by 2030, and about 29 or 30 million metric tons of production between Canada and the US by 2030, that's still about a, only a quarter of our canola will be used towards biofuels we actually view that the rest of canola will continue to be used uh, for its traditional purposes 
as a food uh, ingredient and also as a feed ingredient. So last slide here, just in terms of some summary and discussion. So this is obvious, but worth reiterating again, demand and production of biofuels is growing. It's government policy and politics really are the key driver. Um, so I put the politics there in parenthesis because Again, these are regulatory markets. Um, things can change, of course, because of politics, but the politics currently are all about GHG emission reductions and biofuels is a proven way to reduce emissions from the transportation sector. So again, there's a high level of optimism and confidence that the policies and regulations on biofuels are here to stay for the foreseeable future. It's a catalyst for new crush investments and increasing canola demand. And as I said on the previous slide, uh, demand from the non-fuel markets, so food and feed, will continue to dominate for canola. It's really critical that we see growing supplies and improve productivity of canola to match demand. Um, how is that going to be done? Um, again, I think I touched upon some of that in the previous slide, uh, just in terms of new varieties, better yields because of those varieties, better farm practices, more precision agriculture that can squeeze out better yields per acre. Um, but there's also opportunities perhaps to see some expansion of canola acreage in, in North America. There's increasing talk about maybe expanding acres in the brown soil zone of Canada. Uh, in the US Pacific Northwest, uh, we certainly have seen some increased acres in that part of the world. So um, although we do rely a lot on productivity gains to increase canola production, there's certainly some potential for increased acreage as well. Um, something else just for discussion here today is maybe there's some varieties that can support higher yields and or higher oil content. Um, so sometimes it's more about how many uh, tons per acre of oil you're getting and not so much about the bushels per acre, although ideally we'd like to have both. Um, and just lastly, and maybe this dovetails nicely into the last presentation, uh, there's maybe also potential for increased acres of other oil seed crops. So I know the next speaker will be covering off camelina, but there's also some other varieties of oil seeds out there that are starting to gain some more interest, such as Carinata and Pennycress, and how those crops can get used in a farmer's rotation in Canada and the US. So I'll stop there, Mark, and happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Chris. Yeah, I know our audience is definitely interested in uh, possible varieties that support higher yields or high, higher oil content. And, and so is that something that's really on your radar? Can you speculate a bit in terms of, you know, breeding new varieties of oil seeds with, with biofuels in mind specifically? Is that something that we could see on the horizon possibly? Yeah, it's a good question. I'd, I'd say we're just starting to ask some of those questions and have those conversations in terms of what's feasible as it relates to higher oil content. There's there's a trade-off. So if you're going to have higher oil content, what does that mean in terms of what the protein content is for the canola? Recognizing that canola is crushed for its oil, but the protein side of the equation is important and we want to make sure we have some maximum value there. Um, we also don't want to compromise yields, right? Bushels per acre. This is important. Um, so again, we're just starting to have some of those conversations and look forward to seeing what is feasible as it relates to trying to check all the boxes, if you will, in terms of maintaining protein, maintaining that bushel per acre, increasing that bushel per acre, but at the same time also driving a higher oil content if possible. Yeah, I know there's some pea varieties out there, yellow pea varieties that are very high protein that uh, growers are, are getting paid premium for to grow those peas under contract for the plant-based protein market. And so it's interesting to think that could we arrive at a point where growers get paid a premium to grow certain canola varieties that have, you know, a high oil content that could be used for biofuel production or something like that. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to, to see the, where this all goes. Thank you so much, Chris. You're welcome. Excuse me, Mark. Uh, your audio cut out. Oh, thanks, Ashley. I'm sorry. I, I, I was muted. 
my my apologies. As I said, last but not least, we're going to hear from Jack Grushko. He is CEO of Smart Earth Seeds. <clears throat> Sorry, Smart Earth Camelina Corporation based in Saskatoon. Now, you may have heard about Camelina in regard to biofuels. Smart Earth's associate breeder, Elaine Qualter, was actually featured on our cover Last November, we wrote an entire feature story about the topic of Camelina. You can find the URL right there, or even go to our website, germination.ca, and just search the word Camelina. It'll be the first thing that comes up. Unfortunately, Jack couldn't join us today, but I did pre-record a short talk with him the other day. I'm going to play that for you now. It's about nine minutes long. I'm also going to play a very short video. It's about one minute just to show you what Camelina looks like as a crop. Very similar to canola, actually. So I'll play that for you now, and then we'll hear from Jack. And we'll do a very short Q&A at the end. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. And we'll have a short Q&A with Steve and Chris. But without further ado, we will um, talk a little bit about Camelina now. Well, Jack, thank you for joining us on the webinar today. Thanks for having me, Mark. Much appreciated. Now, you are the president and CEO of Smart Earth Camelina Corporation. I always hear about Camelina when I hear about oil seeds and biofuels. What can you tell us about Smart Earth Camelina Corporation and, and Camelina in general and its relation to biofuels? Sure, great. Um, well, we've been breeding this very interesting crop for almost 20 years. It's, uh, it's a crop that's been around human development for thousands of years. If you take a look at the historical record back as far as Neanderthal man, Vikings, um, uh, Egyptians, Romans, you know, the, the point of origin of this crop is in the Eastern Mediterranean and actually all the way up to the steppes to Siberia, which is, uh, interesting because it'll have some um, some impact on our later discussion of why it happens to be a very good crop for biofuel. But we started developing spring, as I say, almost 20 years ago. It, we like the crop because it was it's very well suited to dry land production in Western Canada and, and uh, the northern tier states. It's frost tolerant in the early stages and drought tolerant later. It's a lower input crop than some of the oil seeds, like let's say canola in particular. So it, uh, from a carbon intensity point of view, it ticks a lot of boxes for people that are looking for feedstocks for biofuel. When we started breeding this crop, it's a very small seeded crop. It didn't have a lot of the agronomics that you'd want an oil seed to have to be competitive. Small seeded, no disease resistance, no herbicide resistance. So. With our conventional breeding program over the years, we were able to increase the seed size by over 40% without a yield drag, which is significant. Because if you know anything about oil seed breeding in general, typically seed size is negatively correlated to uh, oil seed yield. And because we have large nurseries and we make a lot of selections, we were able to find an outlier. We were also able to develop a variety that has quantitative resistance to downy mildew, which is one of the few things that bothers this crop. 
But it's taken us a decade and we've just released it our first year last year is the real game changer for the crop, which is a broad leaf uh, group to herbicide tolerance. So we figure the crop, the spring variety now is really able to take its place among oil seed rotations. And we've been growing this and producing it for almost 14 years in Western Canada. And typically our sweet spot of production is the drier, lighter soils where canola typically will yield, let's say 25 to 30 bushels an acre. And we're very competitive. We'll yield the same, but our seed costs are significantly lower and our inputs lower. So it's more bottom line to the grower in areas where <clears throat> they wouldn't normally get their 50 bushel an acre canola and they could defray the cost of all those expensive inputs and the super expensive seed costs. Plus we're headquartered in Saskatchewan. So all the money from our business development stays in the province. We grow our business here. So in regards to camelina and its use for biofuels, like I mentioned, I, I always hear about, about camelina as sort of this new and exciting crop that, that could potentially be used, for example, to make, to make airplane fuel as a replacement for, for that. What, what can you tell us about this crop and its possible use for, for biofuel manufacturing? Well, the interesting thing about this crop, I mentioned before, its point of origin includes Siberia. And over the millennium, this certain land races of this, uh, of this oil seed have developed to require true vernalization. So they need to be frozen in, this, in the fall and thawed out in the spring to start to grow. It's the only oil seed that we know of that can actually survive consistently over the winter in the northern tier states and western Canada. So we plant it in the fall. It gets to a small stage. It freezes. And as soon as the spring comes, uh, it starts to grow again. And this has a lot of huge benefits for fuel production in the environment in general. Uh, it's really an excellent scavenger of residual nitrate in the soil from the previous crop. It decreases soil erosion because it's a green cover crop. Um, it's one of the very few broadleaf annual winter crops that survives the winter. Okay, so it's again, it's an excellent cover crop after soybean and before corn. So this is going to uh, deliver a lot of potential acres. Um, there's been a lot of talk about bee populations, and I know our colleagues at the USDA have done some very interesting studies on the threatening uh, population of bees because it is uh, it, it's. Um, it, it, it grows early in the spring. It provides an early forage crop for bees at a time where typically nothing else is available, especially in these corn soybean monocultures where basically the soil is stripped in the early spring. Um, in the dry spring when cover crops such as rye use too much water, um, camelina is not as high a water user and it's easier to terminate than rye. So there's a lot of producer scenarios that would work. Um, it basically, uh, it, because it's early maturing, it allows for relay and double crop and with soybean and sunflower, and it fits in a sorghum rotation. So because this, this interesting crop has the vernalization requirement, it gives you a lot of flexibility and produces a very low carbon intensity feedstock. And as you can imagine, in, in the last six months, we have had people knocking on our door because there's going to be tremendous pressure on feedstock supply. And if you take a look at all the big boys that have been building these huge processing capabilities, where is the feedstock going to come from? You know, um, it's interesting if you take a look at trends, and I'm a big believer in following trends. REG was purchased by Chevron a few months ago for $3.5 billion, okay? Now, Chevron's announced huge increases in, in uh, renewable biofuels. Well, where is the, where is the um, feedstock going to come from? So Camelina is a great fit. It's part of the solution, obviously not the solution, total solution, because the scale of the requirement is so overwhelming. Um, but it's a huge opportunity for us because we're the leader in Camelina development. We've been doing it for 20 years. And the winter variety, one of the things I want to mention is there's really only a couple of public varieties available. And they're even smaller seeded and have even more drawbacks than the spring varieties that we started with 20 years ago. 
So our program in winter is to introgress all of the hard-won agronomic benefits we've developed over the last 20 years to rapidly develop a very competitive winter variety. So it's a super exciting time for the company. Yeah, in terms of huge opportunities, before I let you go, if you can gaze into your crystal ball for a minute and, and maybe speculate on, on the future of Camelina as, as a source for biofuel, what does that look like? Do you, you see Camelina being a major player in the biofuel market and in the near future, or might it take a certain number of years? What, what, what do you see coming down the road? Well, I would, uh, there's tremendous pressure on, 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 on feedstock supply. So I think our program is going to be accelerated just because of some of the partnerships we're discussing now. Um, is this a million or a two million acre crop in the northern tier U.S. and western Canada? I would think that would be a reasonable goal in five to seven years. Wow, five to seven years. Yeah, like that's actually not that long in the future when you consider how fast time goes. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see to see the crop develop. And I know we did a story on it recently in Germination. It was actually a, a cover story of ours. And so it's something that, that will continue to, to follow in the future. And no, thanks so much for your time, Jack. It was great to talk with you today. Well, thanks for accommodating me. I appreciate it, Mark. A pleasure meeting you. And uh, any comments, interest, questions, I hope the, the viewers will reach out. I'm happy to discuss more. And our website has tons of information and hundreds of reviews and papers and, and lots of background on this crop. So if they want to peruse the website, smartearthcamelina.ca, they, they, I think there'll be a lot of information for those that are interested. Sounds great. Have a great day, sir. Okay. Thanks, Mark. That's awesome. And thank you so much to Jack for that great talk. It was uh, great to learn more about Camelina. And like I say, go to our website, germination.ca, and check out that story. Before we sign off here for the day, we'll do a, a short q and I have Steve and Chris back on the line with me. So if you have a question for them, please just type it into the chat box at any time. I did have a question in regards to electric vehicles and how will the adoption of electric vehicles impact the demand for biofuels? Could either of you gentlemen maybe maybe speculate on that a little bit? We keep hearing about electric vehicles in the news all the time. I think it was, I can't remember, was it the European Union? It was in the headlines there last week that there's a very ambitious goal of, I think it was by the year 2030, that they were going to be phasing out gasoline vehicles in favor of electric vehicles. And so, so this is coming down the road. What are your, what are your thoughts there? I'll take a stab at that one, Mark. Um, maybe before I do, I just want to do, take a question from the Q&A in the chat, if I could. There was one from Courtney Welch about sure. um, the Canola's pathway, its approval in the United States. Um, I think you said at the top of the call that it's been approved and that's a, a common misconception in this regulatory process in the state. So there's currently a, a draft rule for canola to be approved in renewable diesel production in the states. We're actually still waiting for the final rule. So I thought I'd just kick it off by clarifying that, com uh, that component. We are hopeful, though, that we do see canola finally approved in the final rule before the end of this year. Um, but back to your question about um, electric vehicles, they certainly are all the rage these days. There's many different policies and government incentives to see a higher uptake and adoption of EVs, both in Canada and the United States. Um, I think it's safe to say that through those incentives um, and maybe even just a general affordability improvement of electric vehicles, we will see more of those come on the road in the next five, 10 years and going forward. Um, but again, these are road vehicles. These are passenger vehicles, uh, such as cars or light duty trucks. Uh, when we talk about renewable diesel and we talk about biodiesel and the future of things like sustainable aviation fuel, these are gonna have to continue to be used in greater volumes because they're used in sectors that are difficult to decarbonize, that cannot be um, you know, electrified uh, in terms of the engines that you know, drive a Boeing 747 or in, you know, big heavy equipment that are used by farmers or by construction companies or the big 
tractor trailers that we see on the roads every day. Um, these are difficult to electrify, certainly in the coming decades. Um, so we see the opportunities for biodiesel, renewable diesel, and again, sustainable aviation fuel to continue to grow. Another question that came in is about increased acres of canola. This is from Courtney as well, that there's an opportunity for increased acres of canola in the United States. Do we see this happening in the near future or even in Canada? Uh, Steve, what, what do you think in regards to that in terms of increased acres? Is this something that, that you see happening in, in the near future as, as a result of this? You know, I don't uh, follow that particular um, uh, market super closely mark uh, i would say that and maybe i'll get chris to chime in if he thinks otherwise or wants to add a little bit but certainly in canada i mean we have our kind of base acres that we've kind of um, um, gotten to and certainly again speaking to one of chris's slides it's about that production off that kind of general base of existing um acres with uh, as he as he pointed perhaps some um, entry into some other soil zones in Canada. I'm not um, super close to what's going on in the United States as far as their ability to move into new areas uh, to up production, but perhaps uh, Chris could chime in from um, his perspective. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I did mention, I think it was in my last slide, that we see some increased acres or the potential for even further acres in places like the Pacific Northwest. Um, there's been some very positive growth in terms of acres in that part of the United States. Um, I believe we're seeing that as well, and even um, Montana uh, growing their acres, um, but the potential for some winter varieties. Um, I know there's been discussions, and this isn't new by any stretch, but Oklahoma does still have some acres of canola, but perhaps with uh, the advent of more renewable diesel production capacity coming online and uh, the comments from your last speaker with regards to that million dollar question, where's all the feedstock going to come from, right? We might actually see some of those winter acres expand in places where it never really quite got a foothold like Oklahoma. Um, but I, I think in terms of Courtney's specific question in the near future, it does appear to me anyway that places like the PNW and, and Montana is where we're seeing that expanded acres happen already. Now, before we sign off for the day, we'll take one more quick question. Barry Manacle asks, what percentage of the current crush capacity is destined for biofuel versus traditional markets? And is this compatible with current projections? Yeah, um, I'll take a stab at that one as well. So when we look at that second to last slide that I put up that showed what percentage of canola is currently being used for biofuel production, we peg it at you know roughly 10% of production now. Um, we do see that growing, of course, with all the different capacity for renewable diesel and the demand that we see coming down the pike here. Uh, but really, what we view canola as as you know still being the biggest market, even by 2030, is the traditional market of uh, food and feed. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. I really appreciate your time, Chris and Steve. Thank you so much for your insights today. And I just like to uh, mention again that a recording of this webinar will be available on our website within 48 hours. And before we sign off, I just want to thank our sponsors one more time, 2020 C Labs and CCAN for their support. That's all the time we have today. Great webinar. Thank you to our speakers and thank you to our audience for spending your lunch hour with us. This is Mark Zinkowitz of Germination signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.